can I commence uh, by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm working today? And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which you all are seated and um, whether that's in Melbourne, Victoria or across Australia or indeed across the world. And I'd also like to extend an acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining with us today. Uh, my guest is Karen Mundine and I'm thoroughly looking forward to talking to her and uh, through me putting your questions to Karen over the hour that we have together. Just briefly and by way of introductory comment, um, Melbourne Law School is celebrating National Reconciliation Week, as is the university and as is the nation. As Karen's um, backplate beautifully depicts, we are in this together uh, and, and we'll be exploring that uh, further this afternoon. This is the third and final series in our event and I am delighted to have as my guest, Karen Mindine. I'm also delighted to have those of you who are participating joining us. It's wonderful to see the Melbourne Law School community, including students, alumni and our friends, coming together and reflecting on race relations in Australia. The 3rd of June is also another very significant day. And on this last day of Reconciliation Week, I thought I'd like to acknowledge that today is Mabo Day. On 3 June 1992, the High Court of Australia ruled on the landmark decision which recognised native title in this country. And I would like to remember and acknowledge Eddie Koiki Mabo, Reverend David Parsi, Salawa Mapu Sali, Sam Parsi, and James Rice, and the many others that were involved in that complex and protracted litigation, which was a Herculean effort on their part to secure the recognition of native title in Australia. The topic of today's discussion is towards a reconciled Australia. And we are also going to reflect a little on what that might mean for the legal industry, and indeed for universities as a part of that. The event is being recorded and is live, and we can make this recording available at, from our website at a later date. We encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, these will be moderated behind the scenes, and then I will put these questions to Karen as the time allows. And I'd like to apologise in advance if for any reason I don't get to your question. The chat function, though, I need to let you know has been disabled. Can I now turn to introducing the wonderful Karen Mundine? who is a proud woman from Bundjalung Nation of Northern New South Wales. Karen is the CEO of Reconciliation Australia, a role I think you've held, Karen, since 2017. She has more than 20 years experience leading community engagement, public advocacy, communications and social marketing campaigns. Karen has been instrumental in some of Australia's watershed national events, including the Apology to the Stolen Generation, Centenary of Federation comm Commemorations, Corroboree 2000, and the 1993 Australian Reconciliation Convention. Karen holds a BA from the U University of Technology, Sydney, and is a director of the Godwana Children's Choir Board. Welcome, Karen. It's wonderful to have you here this afternoon. Thank you, Pip. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you uh, and to have this conversation. And can I also just begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the beautiful lands of the Gadigal people and uh, the people of the Gadigal Nation and those in the Sydney Basin, those part of uh, the Eora Nation, uh, are some of the communities that were first impacted by colonisation and those first waves of migration into this country. So I, I pay my absolute respect to, to their elders, uh, those that have passed, those that continue to fight and lead us, and also acknowledge for that new generation of people that are coming through to, to pick up 
uh, those next uh, steps and to lead us into a, a better and brighter future. Welcome. Reconciliation Australia was established in 2001 to be the lead body for reconciliation in Australia. It's an independent not-for-profit organisation that promotes and facilitates reconciliation by building relationships, respect, trust between the Australian community and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Can you speak to us, uh, Karen, about the history of Reconciliation Australia? Yeah, sure. So um, we grew out of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which was set up uh, in the early 90s. And in turn, uh, the Council was actually a recommendation that came out of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody um, to form as a process of reconciliation to look at that relationship between First Nations peoples and other Australians. And, and I guess the impact that that was having uh, on the disproportionate and, and uneven um, outcomes for our people. So there was a 10 year process and at the end of that 10 year process uh, at Corroboree 2000, uh, the council uh, set out a declaration towards reconciliation. And one of its final recommendations was setting up uh, an independent body, which is where Reconciliation Australia uh, grew out of. So over the last uh, 20 years, and of course, Corroboree 2000, uh, which was a, a convention where we had uh, leaders from every state and territory, uh, Premier and Chief Minister, as well as the Prime Minister and the Governor General at the time and the Leader of the Opposition, who all made commitments uh, towards reconciliation. Uh, the day after that corroboree, we saw uh, a quarter of a million Australians walking across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, and in the days, weeks and months that followed, there were walks uh, right across this country, across bridges, across uh, main streets of towns, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, lending their support to reconciliation. So I guess that's the legacy that we at Reconciliation Australia uh, inherited. And really boiling it down to its simplest um, ideals, it's uh, the legacy of how do we turn those intentions of 20 years ago, those good intentions into actions, um, into real tangible outcomes that benefit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And so how do you characterise the work of Reconciliation Australia today? So we, um, one of the, the key areas that we were working on at that time was obviously uh, the government not saying sorry. And so we'd worked very closely with Stolen Generations uh, to get that national apology up. And I think what we saw in that moment was uh, Australia starting to grapple with some of our history and our true history. Uh, in the more recent years, we've started to define reconciliation through five dimensions of reconciliation. Um, and they are race relations, equality and equity, institutional integrity, historical acceptance and unity. And I guess we talk about those five dimensions as our fundamental or foundation building blocks for this idea of reconciliation. Um, and the really important thing in all of that is that those five dimensions are all interrelated. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're also only as far progressed uh, as the least progressed in those ideas. So I guess when we're talking about race relations, it is about that two-way relationship between First Nations and other Australians. And I guess it's about how do we work at building stronger links and connections uh, and the relationships that are based on trust and respect and that are absolutely free of racism. Uh, when it comes to equality and equity, it is about ensuring that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participate equally, equally and equitably uh, in all aspects of life. Uh, that you know, we're closing the, those gaps in life expectancy, that the equal opportunity to uh, health, education, housing, uh, opportunities to progress, but also our distinctive rights as First Nations people is understood, it's embraced, and it's also actually supported through all of our systems and structures within our society. And I guess that kind of leads into institutional integrity. So mm -hmm. all of our systems, all of our organisations and institutions, that they are actively supporting these concepts of reconciliation, that they're thinking about the things that they do uh, within their policies and processes that contribute to these better outcomes. Um, and then if we look at unity, this is where we as a nation actually value 
uh, what it means to, to have First Nations people as a proud part of who we are as Australians, that we embrace that 60,000 plus years of history uh, as being intrinsic and unique to us as Australians. And wrapped in through all of that is this idea of historical acceptance. Um, it's about truth telling. It's about owning all aspects of our history, but not just knowing it as, as sets of dates or things that happened in the past, really exploring that past but understanding what it means for us today um, what that history what that relationship of the past has done to impact who we are today and the situations we find ourselves in today but more importantly it's saying we've made mistakes in the past mm -hmm. we need to do things differently going forward so it's it's not only about knowing the past and knowing where we've come from but making a commitment to do things vastly different into the future so that all of our um, opportunities and all of our outcomes are much better. So is there an attention or um, it might be a strength, but between national and local work or activism for a reconciled Australia? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's attention. Um, it's all intrinsically linked. Uh, I think when we have these conversations at big national levels, I think that's really important. Uh, we know that leadership from the top actually can drive and accelerate things in a much greater way. I guess we saw that uh, with the apology to the stolen generations. But we've also got to make sure that reconciliation and th these concepts that we're talking about are actually being felt uh, and experienced by people in communities. And it's something that, uh, having worked in this space for quite some time, it's something that I'm very conscious of and it's something that um, I wanna make sure that the work that we are doing uh, is actually being felt in a real way on the ground, in communities, in the places where we live, in the places where we work, in the places where we learn, uh, and the places that we socialize. So. Um, I think it's again, it's about how do those things connect and work together because they do reinforce one another. Um, we know that leaders uh, can be influenced by the people and the people's movement. Um, and we also know that the people's movements can be inspired by great leadership. So it, it's always that balancing act of getting those things both working together. So let's uh, maybe shift our focus for a moment then to the legal industry. Um, certainly as a community of students and researchers and uh, also a community of lawyers, the law school has a particular interest in uh, the role of law in achieving reconciliation uh, and acknowledges also, of course, that law plays a very important role in that reconciliation journey. Um, the question of protecting rights, the question of what legislation ought to be enacted uh, the way in which institutions need to enable access to justice. And so there's clearly an important role for law lawyers and their institutions in a discussion around reconciliation in Australia today. What does active support of reconciliation from lawyers look like? It's a great question. Um, so when we think of, actually just go back to your intro, it's National Reconciliation Week. Uh, the week is bookended by two major changes in law. It's around the 1967 successful referendum, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, made changes within the constitution to uh, give the federal government powers to make laws uh, for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, and it was also, and as you said before, today is Mabo Day, and it was about the High Court's recognition of native title within law. Um, and really two very important legal um, actions and moments, but that also started to shape and develop the relationship between First Nations peoples and other Australians. Mm -hmm. So law is absolutely fundamental um, to who we are and, and how we progress these ideas of reconciliation. Uh, we have a saying at Reconciliation Australia that reconciliation is everyone's business. Uh, and a lot of our programs are, are basically are geared towards how do we help and support other people, other organisations, other institutions to engage in reconciliation. Uh, so RAPS is something that I'm sure many people would have heard of, our reconciliation action plans. And of course, uh, the University of Melbourne uh, does have a RAP as well. Um, and the idea and function of this is about uh, 
what can an organisation do within its internal processes that addresses some of these ideas of reconciliation? Uh, we use a really simple framework of relationships, respect and opportunities. We fundamentally believe if you act respectfully, that build respectful relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, then we can create opportunities, be that whether it's employment, whether it is um, better customer bases or better service, uh, whether it's uh, procuring business uh, through Indigenous businesses. Uh, all of these are contributing. But there's also something else that fits within that and particularly, and I would, I would suggest uh, for law schools and others, there are unique things that you as a law school can do to influence. Um, so we see that through advocacy work. Uh, we see that through um, uh, submissions and influencing when there are reviews on laws and legislation. Uh, we've seen it most recently around the Uluru Statement and support for uh, constitutional reform and, and also support for a voice to parliament. So I guess all of these things sort of play out of how do we both collectively and individually um, take action through this? Um, incarceration, I think, is probably another one where we've seen, um, we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 15 times more likely to be incarcerated uh, than other Australians. And what we've seen is uh, various law councils and, and law firms coming together around the idea of justice reinvestment and advocating for for better processes, for changes to law, um, to raise uh, the, the age of culpability from 10 to 14. Uh, these are really important conversations uh, and conversations that are happening across the law fraternity. Yeah. So that's a really um, elegant point to make to the Dean of a law school. The, the role, I think, and, and necessary responsibility of teaching tomorrow's lawyers, but also the way in which we need to engage through our scholarship and our research and our advocacy around the legal issues of today. And I guess the other one that I would add to that really um, challenging list that you made is the work around treaty around the country at the moment. Uh, and I know we had a panel last week with the topic of the conversation being treaty nationally and indeed comparatively. Um, the law school accepts that responsibility, so thank you for that reminder, Karen. But has let's look a little at um, lawyering and the role of firms as well, if we might, for a minute. In your view, or perhaps in the view rather of Reconciliation Australia, have we seen the legal sector actively supporting reconciliation? I I would. Say Say yes, uh, we have a number of law firms who have reconciliation action plans. And I would say here, just in terms of RAPS, um, there is a spectrum um, there. Uh, it reflects where an organisation might be within their, their own journey of reconciliation. Um, of course, I would like them to be all at the top of that and doing things amazingly and uh, you know, hiring more Indigenous lawyers and being more active and all the rest. But um, one thing I have learnt uh, in this role and, and doing this work is this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, and it's just as important to bring people along with us. So um, through our reconciliation action plans, it's also about asking people to internally address, I guess, their own biases, their own assumptions. Uh, it is about bringing the collective along, as well as then thinking about what that collective can look like within, um, within those institutions. Uh, particularly with those law firms, as I mentioned before, the Uluru Statement, there are a number of uh, law firms that that uh, led uh, support for that in a very public way, which is really heartening to, to do. We have what we call uh, RINGS, so Reconciliation Industry Network Groups, and um, we have them for different industries, and there is a, a legal one. Uh, and again, it's those uh, organisations that have signed up to RAPS to collectively coming together and and not in a competitive way, but actually in a collaborative way, thinking about how do they um, address some of those issues that I, I mentioned before, so incarceration rates, um, uh, changes to law and legislation, uh, and doing it as a, a, a single voice or at least a collective voice, uh, because we know that that has more power. Um, so, and do you see that trend towards or that encouragement that's been picked up around looking at collective action 
is it at a point at which we talk about a different practice today from the practice of a decade ago or, or 20 years ago, if just looking at the legal industry? I'd like to think so. And I have to put my caveat here is that I'm not a lawyer. Mm. And I think I did uh, in my arts degree, I did maybe one uh, unit on uh, defamation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the extent of it. But uh, I would like to think it is, and and I guess that's the point and purpose of the, the RAPL uh, plans, is that it's about changing uh, the status quo, it's about changing these institutions that have been failing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in many ways. Um, the systems have not been working, the systems have uh, continued to reinforce bias or uh, uh, inequality, and so what we're trying to do through uh, this program is to actually open that up and, and get the people who are the experts in these fields to really think about and address how that can change and what that might look like. So not infrequently, um, non-Indigenous lawyers will have raised with me what is it that they could do to indicate their support for reconciliation. So, and, and in particular, perhaps if you're a retired lawyer, so you no longer have the agency of an institutional transformation where you once might have worked that, uh, what is a contribution that a non-Indigenous Australian can make and a non-Indigenous lawyer perhaps as well? I think uh, regardless of whether you're retired or not, uh, we all have agency in our lives. And I would suggest that retired uh, lawyers probably have somewhat more agency than others. Um, it is about uh, doing that inward looking at yourself and thinking about what is your, um, what are your biases? What are your uh, unconscious biases in some respects? It is about educating yourself more. Uh, there are so many uh, ways now to engage online. Um, and if, if nothing else, uh, one of the good things that came out of this pandemic is that uh, while life is very different for all of us at this point, uh, it hasn't stopped. Uh, and in fact, it's driven us all into this uh, virtual and digital world that opens us up in a, a much greater way than ever before. And so there is lots of information out there. There are um, uh, programs like, or sorry, campaigns like uh, Justice Reinvestment uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services. Uh, there are ways that people can support that by signing petitions, uh, offering their advice and their expertise in a pro bono uh, kind of way. Mm -hmm. Just because it's not getting counted within your firm anymore doesn't mean you don't have that knowledge. Uh, it is about um, uh, lending your voice to those submissions that, that come up and to, to make those statements, to uh, start those conversations with co colleagues and former colleagues. Uh, it is about demanding of our leadership, um, our legislators and our parliaments, that actually we need to do better. And so I think there are all sorts of ways that um, anyone can create change. And so one of the goals of, uh, I think it's goal six of Reconciliation Australia, is to work with or to encourage governments and corporate partners also to practice good governance. Um, a goal, I think, which has at its heart the idea of meaningfully for corporations and the government sector to meaningfully engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Have you seen a change over your long history of working in this place in the way that governments and corporations uh, are engaging with race relations or support for Reconciliation Australia, whichever way you want to take it? Yeah, I, I have seen change, um, most definitely, and certainly in the corporate sector, um, not to harp on again about our Reconciliation Action Plans, but we do have over 1,100 organisations that are engaged in, this, uh, in that program who are making those public commitments. I guess for me, coming from a, a communications and a marketing background, the challenge for me will always be how do those organisations actually live up to their brand and their values? Uh, we can see a lot of the lip service. We can see people that have grand gestures or statements, but uh, often those uh, their actions don't meet those uh, grand statements or that brand or value that they ascribe to. 
Uh, and that's always challenging. Um, and that also creates uh, bigger conversations for us as well. Because as I said, the simplest inheritance that we got from 2000 in those bridge walks is to turn good intentions into actions. We want those actions to be real. We want them um, to actually progress these ideas of reconciliation and actually uh, make things better for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, I think it's always challenging. I feel there are times when we move forward and then we move back. Uh, but for us, we continue to move forward, or at least we try to continue to move forward. Um, we do need to hold people more accountable for those things when they don't, uh, their values don't match or their actions don't match their values. What, what would be some, I mean, I think you mentioned 1,100 reps there, Karen. What would some successful or, or action-packed wraps look like? What are some of the features that you think have, have fallen out of the development of wraps that could be a benefit to a wider audience to hear about? I think definitely um, an awareness raising uh, is sort of, I guess, the biggest impact. Um, we're having conversations with organisations or, or people that we would never have had um, conversations with before. Um, and that's as a starting point. I guess the challenge for all of us is to make sure it moves beyond just the conversation. It moves beyond uh, a morning tea for National Reconciliation Week. And don't get me wrong, I do love a good cuppa and a, a Waddle Sea cupcake. But uh, we all know that if we're really fair dinkum about this, if we really want to see progress, it has to go beyond that. Um, often it's talked about in this sort of symbolic versus practical um, I don't see them as an either or thing. I think they are both again entwined and you need both uh, to inspire, but also to push us forward and to really get into those harder, more challenging conversations. Um, one of the really interesting things, and it's probably more on the symbolic, but I think it has a deeper kind of, um, or it's the start of a deeper conversation is a lot of institutions, I know Australia Post have done this, and a lot of our banking institutions, just by solely recognising that they are on Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander land and acknowledging um, traditional custodians and traditional owners is a really big step in terms of starting a bigger conversation. And it, it is about changing that relationship and respecting uh, us as First Nations people and what that truly means. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing bigger conversations. I mean, there's lots of things that happen around employment, um, I think there's about 49,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who work within an organisation with a RAP. Um, there's definitely 2.7 million Australians who either work or uh, study in an organisation that have a RAP. So that's a huge percentage of our uh, working uh, Australian population that we have an opportunity to, to engage with and start conversations. Um, we're seeing sort of bigger conversations of, well, if we acknowledge we are on country, what does that mean for the relationships that we have and how we engage around that? Um, what is the, the history of how we ended up owning this country or being on this land? Uh, and I guess, you know, particularly when we look at uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, some of those organisations that are further along in their journey and um, are thinking in quite a sophisticated way about how their business practices impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So that's, a, I think, a really uh, evocative way to think of the commitment as both symbolic and practical and not to create a binary, but to see that the two are in constant interaction with each other. And I understand the examples you've given, particularly around acknowledgement of, of country as a way of moving discussion and changing understanding. What might, if I can push you even just a little bit harder, um, you talk towards the end there about sort of more sophisticated but practical approaches. Can you give our wonderful participants a sense of what some of that might look like? Because organisations are at different stages in this journey. And here's an opportunity to challenge us to, to, to step up further or higher. In, in terms of our reconciliation initiatives? Yeah, so um, as I said, we kind of, the framing of a wrap really breaks down between relationships, respect and opportunities. And we really are looking for what are the actions that sit under those three categories mm -hmm. uh, that uh, create better outcomes. 
um, there's a lot of work that's been done and I think it can be pushed even further um, around what some people talk about cultural competency or cultural awareness. Um, I think we need to move beyond that, beyond just awareness. It's, it's one thing to know whose country you're on, uh, but it's quite another thing to take that next step of understanding the history of that place and understanding how the history of that place actually impacts on the relationships that um, that traditional those traditional communities may have with institutions, with uh, whether it's educational institutions, whether it's with the law and police, um, or businesses more generally, local government or governments. Um, again, thinking about what you do uh, in your business is how does your business then continue to impact that organisation? Uh, sorry, that that community, um, and are the things that you are doing just reinforcing uh, bad behaviours or or Policies that were just um, policies that reinforce that status quo um, again, whether consciously or unconsciously. Um, truth telling is a really big thing for us. Uh, it's certainly something that we have embarked upon over the last couple of years, really unpacking that connection and nexus between reconciliation and truth telling, or historical acceptance, as we talk about it. Uh, it's so important um, and I think it's great that we are seeing more of those stories, those hard conversations, those hard stories, those difficult, uncomfortable stories, because uh, that's where reconciliation gets to its greediness and I think that's actually more so than what's happened before is where we actually hit the road on what is reconciliation. Uh, it is when we have two opposing forces that are kind of seemingly at first, coming at it from very different angles. And that's um, it's the bit in the middle where we need to not just be safe, but we need to be brave uh, to have those conversations where a business interest is in conflict with uh, a cultural um, uh, interest. And look, we've all seen uh, things that happened at the beginning of this week uh, in the Pilbara, and I have to say it's been quite distressing, mm -hmm. uh, both as an Aboriginal person uh, and uh, I feel um, for the traditional owners you know, in that situation, but also just as, as, as an Australian and as a human, um, we've lost such a great uh, heritage site there. Mm. Now, that's a conversation that we need to pick up as well and, and work through what do we do next? How do we ensure that this does not happen again? How do we ensure that the intentions of words uh, and, as I said before, those actions mm. actually marry together? Yeah, I was really interested. I um, went to the Reconciliation website in the last week and had a look at the barometer of, of attitudes. And f from memory, I think it's the most recent national barometer is 2018. And in that publication, it was mentioned that about 90% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and 80% of the non-Indigenous population believe it is important to undertake formal truth-telling processes in relation to Australia's shared history. Um, does Reconciliation Australia have a view about the range of formal processes that are available? So yeah, a couple of years ago uh, we held a symposium uh, mm -hmm. just to to pull together some people to kind of really unpack uh, what we mean or what we understand this truth-telling idea to mean. Uh, and also, I guess, to start to help us to chart through what does this mean and what does it look like? Um, obviously, a Makarata Commission um, and a formal truth and reconciliation process is one of the recommendations out of the Uluru Statement. And of course, we wholeheartedly support that. But I guess what we're also thinking about is we have this cohort of organisations and communities that we engage with. So what is the best way for us to contribute towards mm -hmm. the truth telling? Um, so we know and we, we um, I've met with a number of people from the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission to understand the processes there. And I've had some dealings with um, the South African um, process as well. And, and other processes particularly coming out of um, conflict um, mm -hmm. countries around the world. Uh, and I guess, again, thinking what is it that is unique about those processes, but also what is unique about our Australian situation? And what is the thing that we can contribute? And 
while I was fully expecting lots of people to be arguing for a formalised process, and, and there is still, and we're supportive of that idea, mm -hmm. what people really wanted to hear and see was a way for local communities to have those conversations. And I think there's something really powerful um, about, and going back to my point about feeling reconciliation in the places where we live, in the places that we walk past every day. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there where we still have names of places that, you know, were from a different time, and, but I'm amazed that they still remain today mm -hmm. as names of, whether it's sporting ovals or names of creeks or, and things that have just passed on and people probably don't even think about um, why those places were called them. But when we look at our history, when we look at exactly what happened there, they have horrible, horrible meanings and horrible stories behind them. Um, so that's given us a bit of thought. And we've been talking to a, a number of um, local governments because we think that this is again in that local spaces and geographies where it's really important. Uh, to engage them in the process as well as local communities. How can we support that? Uh, what are some of the principles that are important in this process of truth telling? But also what are some practical tools that would help um, communities come together to start that conversation or progress those ideas? Uh, one of the things that I was most um, uh, taken with is we had uh, people from the Mile Creek Massacre um, with us in the symposium and Anisu Blacklock who herself is a descendant of one of the um, uh, people that survived one of the survivors of that um, she told this very powerful story about the kind of struggle that they've, they've undergone and the journey that they've undergone uh, to get that place recognised and, and the real powerful um, movement that is happening every year to acknowledge uh, that site one of the things that she said is that there are two stories uh, of that site. There is the story of the history of what happened there and the unspeakable murders that happened. But there is a second story of the change of reconciliation, of coming together to commemorate that time. And, and she spoke of meeting uh, with one of the descendants of one of the perpetrators of that. And it being this real healing moment for her personally, but also for the community at large. And, um, there's a real hope that that becomes the story that that space and place gets remembered for, not for the sorry and killing times that occurred there as well. And that, I mean, it still kind of chokes me up when I when I think of it and when I, when I hear um, her voice in the back of my head to say that. And, and I guess that's what we're trying to get to in terms of reconciliation. We want those positive stories to be the stories of reconciliation um, moving forward, not just those bad times. For a country as, um, well, just even thinking of local government, but uh, for a country as dispersed as us with communities as diverse as we have, um, how do you, I don't like the verb to catalyse, but how do you create conditions that where local truth telling or local story sharing can be done in a way that is healing? As I said, I think it is important to create safety in all of this. And that was one mm -hmm. of the um, principles that came out of our symposium. Uh, I think the starting place has to be knowing, uh, knowing that history. So I think when we know those things that have happened in the past, it gives us some empathy as to how and why we are in the situations or the relationships that we hold today. So that first piece has to be knowing. Um, in any of these conversations, it has to be uh, safe for people to have those conversations. It can't be about re-traumatising. Mm -hmm. um, it has to have a, a positive or a healing outcome as the intent of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but as I said before, it can't be just about safe. And I think um, sometimes we rest or stop at the safety bit. We actually have to be brave uh, if we're going to have those uncomfortable conversations. And one of the really interesting things we had uh, the, uh, from the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we had the non-Indigenous commissioner who was a keynote speaker at our symposium. And really that was quite deliberate in the sense of we wanted to understand from her as a non-Aboriginal person, Canadian, uh, what was the importance of it for her 
to be part of that conversation. And one of the things that um, quite resonated with me was this idea of bearing witness. And, you know, if we want to talk about what it means to be a non-Indigenous ally or to be a supporter of reconciliation, it was this really powerful concept that as a non-Indigenous person, I have to bear witness to the history that has happened. I have to bear witness to the stories, the hurt, the pain, the trauma. Um, and in bearing witness, I then share a responsibility to do something with that. And I think that, to me, is something that quite... Um, was quite powerful for me and really kind of re maybe think about how we think about reconciliation, how we think about truth telling uh, and how do we move this idea of being an ally beyond just sharing a like or tweeting? Um, how do we move it beyond just walking across a bridge, which is really important and I again stress the importance of that visibility and that feeling supported, uh, but how do we move it into that next piece of advocacy or catalyzing people or however the words we want to use um, to raise our voices collectively to use the advocacy and the agency that we each have within our skill sets and within the circles that we move um, to ask those hard questions to push for those greater outcomes um, and demand um, again looking back on this week and the things that are happening in the US which just it breaks my heart and um, but you know let's not forget that this is not unique to the US um, we have our own history here of uh, violence against um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and particularly deaths in custody so these are all things that we should be all outraged about and not just because it's happening on our TV screens uh, and the other side of uh, the other side of the world these things are happening in our communities and these things um, uh, can be we can do something quite tangibly about it here yeah, and in fact, one of the questions that comes through specifically asks me to explore with you um, your thoughts about George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests happening in the US, but and notes the increasing traction with Australian media as well as global media. But the, the question asks, how can we in Australia trigger or create the same scale for the sense of injustice for Aboriginal deaths in custody, for example? So again, I'd say we, we need to use and be um, our agents of advocacy within ourselves, we use our voices. Uh, we need to be writing and demanding of our policy and lawmakers better outcomes. Um, we've seen people in, in Perth and, and last night here in Sydney, uh, peaceful protests to, to shine the light on this. Um, it's pleasing to see increasingly uh, media are talking not just about uh, what these implications are within the US, but actually the fact that these things happen here in Australia. Um, I think we need to empathise as humans. You know, in Australia, we have over 420 black deaths in custody uh, since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. These are not just numbers, these are people. These are people with families and communities. Um, and we don't have to look that far back either. Uh, for these incidents. Um, just this morning on the news, and, and it happened just Monday, uh, in a park that I walk past every day on my way to work, uh, where a young Aboriginal man was, you know, unduly um, uh, police tripped him up and, and onto the ground, and unnecessarily so. Um, mm -hmm. These are the things we should be questioning, we should be demanding better of. Um, and, you know, I, I acknowledge that there is an investigation, but it has to take that next step. Mm -hmm. So vigilance. Absolutely. And as citizens, we need to be demanding more of that and not just in National Reconciliation Week. If there's anything, again, that I would hope that comes out of this is uh, it's given a greater highlight to things that happen every single day, uh, every single week, uh, every year in our communities. Can I take you back? I've got another question around truth telling. So if, if I can take you back to that um, earlier conversation we were having, Karen. And I'll read you the question. Uh, truth telling is an important part of reconciliation, but when and how do we create the space in our organisations and communities to enable truth telling? I think you talked a lot about how we can enable space within our communities, but it is an interesting question how we enable space within organisations for truth telling. Uh, and as the questioner notes, with the ambition of then being able to move forward together. 
Yeah, well, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, be advocating for a, a, the first conversation to be about massacres. Um, it is about relationship building. And as I said, there is a reason why we use that simplicity of relationships, respect and opportunities. We do have to create relationships with each other so that we feel safety to progress those conversations. Um, I think learning and learning history is a good starting point because it is something that we can do uh, both as individuals but also collectively. Um, and like I, I think back to my university days, which are, are a while now, but you know, taking something that is a fact or that is history and using that as the starting point for the conversation to then explore, well, what does that mean? What, what impact did that have both then and now? What is the analysis of that? And I think, you know, particularly universities have a really important role to play in thinking and asking these questions uh, of us and of our systems. Um, and I think the more we have those conversations, the more we start to unpack that history uh, that truth telling and it's through those conversations it's, uh, we build our relationships, uh, we build our em empathy and the ability to venture into some of this harder territory. Yeah and, and I'm grateful to you Karen for taking us back to the university and um, the possibilities there. I guess uh, as a member of the University of Melbourne but also its law school we do have a commitment, it's through the RAP, but we have the commitment as a question of moral principle as well, to recruit and support uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and researchers and staff. Um, and then there's the challenge and the need that you've articulated so, so well for, for us to recognise and reflect history and learnings and different bases and, and forms of knowledge in our teaching alongside our research uh, and I'm lucky enough to have a group of scholars who work in these areas but in the last 20 years or so what do you think have been some common successes or challenges in engaging young people and specifically university students and graduates in the activities of Reconciliation Australia and the project more broadly? I think young people of every generation um, tend to be at the forefront of these kind of uh, movements of change. I think it's uh, when we're young, we want that better future for ourselves. I think the challenge becomes how do we keep that momentum or that drive and desire as people then start to move through other phases of life uh, when there are other competing priorities. Um, but what I do see is um, new generations of people who are much more engaged and much more um, thoughtful of what they can do within those spheres. In fact, this might seem like a really flippant um, example, but I'm a bit of a foodie. I like, um, I love food, let's just put it that way. Uh, so I'm subscribed to a lot of those kind of lifestyle and foodie type sort of emails and uh, electronic mail. Um, I was really excited to see a number of them referencing National Reconciliation Week and in past years uh, during Na uh, NAIDOC Week as well, knowing that we have no influence or input into that, um, that these issues and these topics are becoming part of the zeitgeist. Uh, and not just in a flippant, you know, here's an Indigenous bush tucker, but actually sort of challenging what, the, um, what we should be all engaging with uh, more, uh, more uh, particularly around, you know, putting, going to challenging films and plays and uh, just acknowledging country in a way, in a very mainstream way that I've not seen before. So I feel that, that um, those voices are uh, there with us and they are building and certainly over the last um, decade, decade or so, uh, that gives me a lot of hope and, and uh, mm -hmm. confidence. We also have uh, an education program, Narraganawali, which she's working specifically with schools and early learning centres. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that we've got nearly 6,000 schools and early learning services that engage, uh, again, in an adapted version of a wrap for uh, those workplaces. But I had the pleasure of going to a couple of uh, preschools and early learning centres last year and to see three and four year olds uh, who can do an acknowledgement of country without a set of words and without a card, um, but can also articulate to me as a stranger 
why they thought that that was important and uh, you know about protecting the land and, and what they do to kind of turn that into their action. So in, in their way, um, uh, showing respect to the traditional owners is about not littering. It's about not leaving rubbish on the ground and it is about protecting the trees and looking after the environment. Um, and that gives me hope again for that next generation as well. Uh, if we can continue that through uh, as they move from preschool into primary school and primary school into high school and on to university and then into jobs, if we've created the right environments through wraps in workplaces and within school systems, they're going to go into those adults that will be the leaders of companies and politicians and uh, decision makers into the future. And, and that's where I'd like to think that's how we're going to create this change. Mm -hmm. So you've raised raps consistently um, in response in different ways to, to the questions this afternoon. Uh, one of our participants asks, um, what is the response for organisations that have raps but violate them? Um, and does reconciliation have a response? Is there a, a punitive consequence? We don't like to think of reconciliation in a punitive way. Uh, RAPs are voluntary. Uh, there is very little things that we can do to uh, leave us to pull, if you like. Having said that, we do take very seriously where there have been uh, breaches. And as I said, where those actions don't marry with the intent of the words on paper. Um, and we'll continue to, we'll have those conversations and we're in those conversations at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say any more at this point because we're, we're still kind of in the midst of it, uh, but we are reaching out and once we've, we've gone through that process, um, we'll make some decisions after that. But we do take it very seriously because our reputation and our intent of words and actions is all that we have to rely on here. So if we uh, cannot follow through on what we say we're gonna do, uh, there has to be a reaction. Right. So it's, from what you said, there's, there's a dialogical mechanism at the very least, a capacity to go back and say, let's talk about the commitment given and the ways in which it could be enhanced, for example. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, I don't want things to continue to happen. I don't want where they've made breaches um, for that to happen again, I want to be able to hold them accountable in some way or shape or form to make changes and to ensure that those changes are resonating within their business or organisation. And so then uh, the next question from one of our uh, attendees is revisiting the issue of um, Rio Tinto's decision to, to blast or the sacred indigenous sites in the Pilbara. Um, is there a response from Reconciliation Australia to that? So we're absolutely appalled by this as all Australians are. We're in conversations with all parties involved and yeah. once we've completed that investigation, we'll make further dis uh, decisions and then we'll make announcements about that. But as I said, it is as much about ensuring these things do not happen again in the future. We want to understand what went wrong, how did this mm -hmm. happen, how did it occur in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, but we also want to be able to hold them accountable for future actions and ensuring that there are going to be changes and that, as I said, um, those words and intentions meet, uh, match their actions. And, and so part of the challenge for an organisation such as yours is that you carry the candle for the inspiration and the aspiration uh, at the same time as carrying the challenge for, I think, what you position, the, the difference between uh, the symbolic and, and, and the practical. And so what I'm hearing from you is Reconciliation Australia walks both paths in all the work that it does. Is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. I think it's certainly what we endeavour to do. Um, we're a, we're a small not-for-profit. We have, you know, 38 staff who I have to say and give a big shout out to who have been amazing in the lead up to this week and throughout and in every day in every way. Um, we run a range of programs. So I've talked a lot about RAPS, but it's not our only program. There are a number of uh, programs that we run with different, uh, different industries and looking at different um, ways to engage in reconciliation. Um, 
we do rely on our uh, partners and those people that engage in our programs to hold themselves to a higher standard and to live up to those standards. Um, so we really, it is about how do we encourage and, and get the best out of everyone um, and how do we uh, ensure that what everyone is doing and within the frameworks that we're setting up, uh, they have the necessary tools and ability uh, to create those better outcomes. Yeah. Well, Karen, thank you very much for talking to me this afternoon and thank you very much to the participants for their questions. Uh, it's the final day of uh, reconciliation across Australia, but as you say, the work of your organisation uh, is also taking place on the other 364 days of the year and we wish you all the best with that. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Thanks. Karen. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah.